so we're now going to move to our um, the second part of our presentation. Um, I'm going to um, we've got three case studies of being um, getting charged up, what we're calling it, and so I'm just going to hand over to Melissa Falkenberg, who's the manager of transport and sustainability at Wyndham City Council, to uh, facilitate the next part. Thanks, Mel. Thanks very much, Bernadette, and lovely to see you all here today. Um, please let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which we join today and pay respect to ancestors and elders past and present. Um, I'm really excited to be hosting this panel session today, um, three cases for getting charged up and look forward to hearing from our panellists and also looking forward to hearing your questions as well. In terms of our panellists, first we have um, Helen Curley, my colleague from Wyndham, who's the coordinator of Climate Resilience. Um, she's led the development of the EV policy at Wyndham and the current focus of hers is the installation of charges to support council's fleet transition, in turn also providing public charging opportunity. We also have Paul Swift from Merrybeck, who's in a similar role, overseeing the installation and management of public charging. And from further afield, we have Annika Keaton. Annika is the Chief Executive Officer of the Central Victorian Greenhouse Alliance, a formal partnership of 13 local governments from Central and Northwestern Victoria, where she's developing a regional EV charging framework. We're going to hear from each panellist for about five or six minutes, and then we'll take questions and discuss the issues until about 10.30. Um, as mentioned earlier, feel free to post questions in the chat. Um, I'll go to Jane at the conclusion of the presentations, um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can before 10.30, but you'll also have the opportunity to raise your virtual hand. Um, great. I, okay, well, we'll start by um, heading over to Helen. Thanks, Helen. Thank, thanks, Mel. Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to share my presentation. So I'm not a normal Zoom operator, so please bear with me and hopefully this is going to work effectively. Can I just get a confirmation whether that one's sharing just yet? Not yet, Helen. Thank you. There we go, I think. Yep, all good, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks for bearing me through that. So yes, I'm coordinator of climate resilience at Wyndham City Council. I'm just going to take you through three slides, which sort of shares our journey so far. I'll try to keep to time. I've got my timer going here, but give me a heads up if you think I'm running out of um, time. Um, just first, a little bit about Wyndham. So these stats are largely from our last census, but we are currently sitting around actually 350,000, a couple of years on from these stats, and we're heading towards 500,000 um, residents by 2040. Uh, we're largely low density housing and most households have some form of um, off street parking. Uh, Council has a strategic commitment to transition its own fleet to low emission passenger vehicles by 2030 through its resilient Wyndham strategy, which was adopted in 2021. Uh, we also have a community zero carbon commitment by 2040. We've also got a massive um, well, I wouldn't say massive, but we've got a fast uptake of EVs within our community. So between 2021 and 2023, it, it increased close to sevenfold um, within that time period in terms of ownership uh, within our local government area. So that's a little bit about us and some further stats there. So our journey so far has started with... Um, probably some opportunistic, obviously our strategic commitment, which I just shared, and then some opportunistic um, installs through the destination charging across Victoria grants uh, at a few of our sites. So um, accessing those grants in 2022 and inst installing through that year. Uh, we then also took on our own policy development um, and inclusion of EV charging infrastructure in our rolling capital program, which is focused on uh, sustainable infrastructure uh, called WINAR. So if I reference WINAR, we're talking about our capital works program for sustainable infrastructure. Uh, policy was developed um, through 2022 and 20, uh, sorry, 2023 and 2024. Um, it 
involved a lot of internal capacity building around EVs. What are they? What are they not? What are charging infrastructure? What are they not? Um, that was both with our sort of internal stakeholders and our councillors. We then did a community count, uh, consultation throughout uh, late 2023 and early 2024. Um, and you can see some of the um, key points there from that community consultation that came back from a community. So the priorities really were reliable access to um, charging infrastructure. So that included um, moving people on from charging spaces effectively, maintenance regimes, and um, making sure we had the correct kind of electricity demand management. There was also a need to prioritise reliable slow charging in infrastructure, which was interesting because the loud um, minority within our community were talking to us a lot about fast charging infrastructure to have that kind of reinforcement of the need for bays for slower uh, charging infrastructure as well within our community was quite interesting. And that there was still a priority to um, focus on other forms of sustainable transport, public transport, active transport, that electric vehicles were not necessarily the golden uh, the silver bullet to solve all uh, decarbonisation issues. And then you can also see here that, um, you know, these are the six principles that we based our policy in. I won't read them one for one. You can all take a look for yourself here and we'll share these later on. Um, moving forward as well, we are starting to focus a little bit more on our own fleet transition. So we had some focus on a fleet transition and obviously the strategic commitment, but we're really uh, having a season of focusing on the public charging infrastructure, but we will, I think, in the near future be focusing more on our own fleet transition and supporting that as well. So I'm just going to speak through quickly um, some of the aspects of our own charger rollout. Uh, it was based in those high-level principles that we shared within um, our policy, but then other considerations can um, we considered for the location of different charging infrastructure that we are largely installing ourselves, um, include distribution of existing and possible charging uh, and possible future charging stations. So what are other people doing, including our neighboring LGAs, our, our integrated transport plan, uh, where are our activity centers or where will be our activity centers, uh, public transport infrastructure, tourism, service stations and built form are all considerations at the high level. Then very specifically at our site-specific um, considerations, we were looking at parking availability, where council services offered through there, was there a council fleet need at that location, did we own the land, electricity um, infrastructure on site, access to renewables, and site visitation rights. Now I'm at five minutes, so I'll just wrap up really quickly. Some of the learnings we've had at the moment um, are that there are multiple models on the market. It's in a transitioning market, players are coming and going, so you need to be aware of that. But there is continuous improvement and other and ongoing um, service models, whether that's hardware, software, or just the service vision models. So stay involved with the market. In a growth area context, which Wyndham is, uh, 4G connectivity is a massive challenge for um, operation of these sites. We have some M MBM workarounds, but not all um, locations are um, suitable for that. And we really recommend setting fees at a market competitive rate um, and collaborating with other operators uh, in the sector. I'll leave that there and pass it on to the next speaker to try and keep us on time, if that's all right now. Wonderful. Thank you, Helen. Um, yes, over to you, Paul. Thank you. Good morning, all. Stay with me. Come in. There we go. Cool. Uh, Thank you all very much. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of Marybeck City Council. Um, the first thing to emphasize um, is that obviously we have a strong policy backing for everything we do. I've got one quote there from our Zero Carbon Marybeck Action Plan. But yes, we have a strong policy backing. Um, here are a lot of chargers. Um, so Marybeck is unusual in the sense that we've been installing and operating chargers for quite some time, 10 years or so. 
Um, and this is a sample of some of our chargers. We've got 28, uh, two of which are DC. Um, observations of this, as somebody said, there are lots of different models, uh, as you can see. Um, in an ideal world, we would have you know, rolled it out in a nice uh, logical manner, but in fact, it was quite opportunistic over time. And as a result, we do have multiple models, which has been interesting because you, know, you get to see them over time and you get to see the different models. Um, second point, I just thought it'd be useful for people to think we've talked about slow chargers, also known as AC and fast chargers known as DC. White charger down the middle, big white box uh, DC, you're talking uh, 50 kilowatts and above. Uh, you're talking roughly 100K to install-ish. Um, the other ones around the sides are more AC chargers, 7 to 22 kilowatts. You're talking 10 to 15K to install. Uh, final observation is if you look at where they're positioned, they all have space behind the parking bay. Um, you know, You can see the curbs there. Um, and this is a, a key factor. So when you go around your car parks or you look around other areas, you're looking for that bit of extra space where you can actually fit the charger. It seems very obvious, but actually there's, there's fewer such bays than you might imagine. Um, last one in the middle is our new Pride and Joy, which is gonna be a DC dual charger. And that's the first one where we've really taken accessibility into account. So we've allowed extra space down the middle there. Um, Lessons learned. So echoing what others have said, uh, near an electrical supply, it's much cheaper if you're either near a power pole or near a transformer, uh, near shops um, where people want to visit, uh, well lit and where there's space, I touched on that. Um, many councils spend what I find an inordinate amount of time analyzing the perfect location. Um, Analyze, but don't spend too long on it. People will travel to get to your chargers. They want to use the chargers. It's a resource. We're going to end up with lots and lots of them. So, you know, don't, don't take too long. Um, apply for your supply early. So I don't, I haven't worked with all of the DNSPs, people who own the grid, um, but they're not fast. Uh, so four to 11 months for new supply is not uncommon. Uh, lessons learned, by and large, these are reliable pieces of kit. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised. We invested in one model at one stage called Tritium, uh, a very early model of charger, uh, and that was an absolute lemon, uh, which is very painful. But beyond that, uh, that's the only one where we got burnt. Uh, the other point to mention that for us, at least thus far, we've had little to no vandalism. So in three years, I've had to replace one cable and one charger had, to, had some slight damage, and that's it. Um, the other point to bear in mind, and, and I'm talking specifically around owning and operating, right? So which, which may not be something you choose to go down. Although I think particularly for slow chargers, AC, you're, there will be demand for our uh, councils to do that. Um, they are not entirely fit and forget. So there is a little bit of looking after that's required. Not too much, not inordinate, um, but it is there. So AC chargers need to be rebooted maybe once every Every uh, once in a while. So for 28, once a week, I go out to reboot one charger. Um, who has the keys to the switchboard? Who has responsibility for that? Uh, you do an annual maintenance check and there are occasional repairs. But um, yeah, it's not, it's not rocket science. Very few things there. Um, and last thing here, our newest addition to our electric vehicle fleet. Thank you all. Oh, and last thing, if you have any questions at any point, I'm very happy to chat through our experience. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and now over to you, Annika. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Was that in presentation mode for you all? Sorry, I'm just having an issue sharing my screen there. Jane, are you able to confirm that you can see that presentation? 
We can't see it yet, Annika. Sorry. Okay. That's looking uh, better. Okay. I've got your screen now. Cool. There we go. Presentation. Great. Sorry. Apologies, everyone. I've got a pretty archaic set up here in my home office. Um, good morning. Thanks for the opportunity um, to present today. Um, I'll be speaking about some lessons from the Charging the Regions project, which um, Central Victoria, Victorian Greenhouse Alliance has led over a number of years. And many of you will be very familiar with this project. So um, I hope to not sort of go over too much old information, but we'll start with a very sort of brief recap and then speak to how um, we're building on the lessons learned from this project in our current phase of work. Um, I'm joining today Sorry. from Catherine. Annika, just, just, oh. just before you keep going, we can see oh, can your, your note oh, screens oh, as well. We can see two oh. screens. Ah, okay, sorry. Again, this is my very, let me see if I can um, get, uh, get that on the right screen for you. For, apologies, it's never good to waste time with these tech issues, but uh, these are the joys of working from a home office. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's try this. Does that look better? Yep. And if you just want to put it on um, slideshow. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. There we go. Thank you so much for that. Um, even though you might like to read along with my notes, so I'll take those off for you. So Chatting the Regions was a three-phase project. In 2020, we undertook an investigative study um, following up with an in, uh, installation project in 2021. Um, and as of this year, uh, we're looking at phase three of Charging the Regions, developing a regional charging framework and implement, implementation plan um, for councils across the CBGA region. Um, in phase one of this project, um, we were really focused on helping councils to understand local government's role in providing, facilitating public electric vehicle charging and identifying opportunities for a more coordinated approach to the rollout of public charging. Um, the focus of this project was on passing through and destination uh, charging primarily, trying to fill gaps in what at the time was a very small network of charges, mainly located on major highways outside of town centres in regional Victoria. Um, and a, a lot has obviously changed um, since 2020 when this study was conducted, um, but there are still some quite useful insights in the report that was prepared for us by Endeavour Environmental. So I've included a link in the slide there in case anyone's interested to, to go back and have a look at that. In 2021, uh, we received funding from the Victorian government as part of the COVID stimulus measures uh, to install a dense network of 23 DC fast charging stations across 13 local government areas from uh, Gippsland right up until Mildura. And Elliot, being in Swan Hill today, will be very familiar with my favourite charger um, because it's lovely to be able to charge your car and get a photo with the big Murray Cod. Um, good op shop across the road as well. So um, uh, this uh, phase of the project um, was really for a lot of regional councils, their first taste um, of playing a more active role in, in the provision of EV charging in many of the towns. These were the first public charging stations to be installed. Based on the previous study um, that was undertaken and in discussion with council, the ownership model um, that was selected was one where councils would own the charges and EV networks was contracted to maintain the network. At the time, uh, this decision was made uh, partly due to the return on investment with significant grant funding available to cover the capex cost, but also because of the early in the early stages. Um, of uh, the rollout of public charging councils were keen to play a more active role to facilitate their own learning and capacity building. Again, a lot has changed since 2021. Um, and so increasingly now councils in regional Victoria view their role as one largely of facilitation rather than direct provisional ownership of charging. Uh, I won't go through these lessons in huge detail because Elliot, Helen and Paul have all touched on many of these points um, or made similar points in their presentations, but these are just some of the lessons we learned from the first two phases of the project and some things that have changed. Um, one point I just want to emphasise there, which has been a key lesson for regional councils, is just how much ongoing resourcing is involved in owning public charges. This was a bit of a surprise for us, um, EV networks. 
uh, operates and maintains the network uh, for councils, but these charges have council logos on them. Uh, and so inevitably when they're not working or when there's issues or there's a car park where it shouldn't be, council are receiving those inquiries. So there's a significant um, resource burden on councils in terms of responding to those public inquiries, ensuring that maintenance requests are actioned in a timely and effective manner, ensuring ongoing maintenance around the site. Um, so, you know, litter and um, unfortunately instances of vandalism occasionally. Uh, and obviously also you know, an increasing challenge with greater demand for public charging um, in terms of compliance with parking rules and ensuring that vehicles aren't overstaying. So um, this, I guess, has really informed uh, regional councils um, uh, in terms of their thinking around their ongoing role in public charging and their ability to resource this work. Um, and as mentioned earlier, many are now sort of uh, have a much lower appetite, I guess, for directly owning this infrastructure um, and are looking towards more of a facilitation model. Um, so Charging the Region 3 commenced this year. We've got eight participating councils across the region um, who are working on this project, which really responded to the evolving context that we're working in um, and aims to update guidance to councils on optimal locations for charging across the region and to inform the development of council policies. Um, the statement on this slide highlighted in green uh, reflects the objectives of participating councils for their role as facilitators of public charging uh, to increase equitable access to public charging infrastructure that meets community needs, maximises co-benefits and minimises cost to council while contributing to net zero targets. Over the last couple of years, regional councils um, have increasingly been contacted by charge point operators about installing charges on public land. Um, but councils, uh, particularly our smaller rural councils, are not always equipped with the information that they need um, and the evidence base to negotiate effectively around the best use of this public land and the best outcomes for their community. So um, this phase of Charging the Region seeks to support regional councils by providing a knowledge base on which to make more robust evidence-based decisions about um, uh, either owning or in most cases facilitating EV charging um, and to provide advice on strategies for negotiation with charge point operators. And we're delighted to have Elliot and his team from the Institute of Sustainable Transport working with us to develop a regional public charging framework um, mapping and prioritisation of optimal locations for charging across the region and municipal implementation plans for eight councils participating in this project. Um, this is an ongoing initiative, but some of the emerging lessons, once again, um, very similar to what you've heard um, from other, president, uh, other presenters this morning. Um, but for regional councils, equitable access is a really key concern when it comes to the rollout of public charging, both for councils and for communities. Um, unfortunately, economies of scale in regional areas mean that there's not always a strong commercial case for charging in some regional and rural townships and locations. Um, so councils are really seeking to understand where, what the optimal distribution of public charging is to support visitors and passing through traffic in the region, while also ensuring that local residents have access to convenient public charging in activity centres when they need this. Uh, councils have noted that residents are likely to express concern when they see multiple or new charging facilities going into nearby towns when none have been installed in their area. So understanding this optimal distribution of charging stations, the use case for charging um, based on projected demand will really assist councils to have conversations with their communities about why it might make sense to install a charger in one location and not another, um, while also demonstrating um, how across the wider region, access to convenience charging is being made accessible to local residents through regional activity centres. When we look at data from existing charges in the region, it's pretty clear in terms of the user profile that these charges are primarily being used by visitors. So people from outside of um, uh, the local area um, who are either visiting or passing through um, and local charging forms a smaller portion of the use of these charges. Um, and as Elliot has mentioned, we are anticipating that most um, residents will be charging their cars at home in future. And this is particularly the case in regional and rural areas where we have less of a concern around access to off-street parking. All of this points to the critical importance of understanding the use case for charging stations in particular locations, which Ellie's also spoken to this morning in terms of market segments for EV drivers. 
There are some unique use cases for charging in regional Victoria, such as drivers who are towing cars or trailers or caravans or boats. Um, so looking at um, ensuring that there is access to, to suitable charging for those unique use cases is something that councils in the regions are looking at as well. And in terms of um, sort of opportunities for further regional collaboration um, on EV charging networks, Grid constraints are a really big concern um, everywhere, but particularly in regional Victoria. So there's significant opportunity for some joint advocacy on distribution network upgrades. Joint procurement opportunities. So councils coming together um, to put out expressions of interest um, for charge point operators to install charges um, by offering high value sites um, that are of commercial interest to those charges in a package that also includes some lower value sites that are of particular interest to community or provide sort of equity benefits to community um, so that we can uh, try to achieve some of those broader community benefit and equity goals in the rollout of charges. Uh, regional network planning, ensuring that neighbouring LGOs are aware of what each other's plans are um, for new charge points and how this might impact the use case for charges in particular locations. Um, and then finally, um, hopefully working towards a common approach to lease fees um, for access to council land and, and licensing agreements. Um, so helping councils to understand what is reasonable to ask of charge point operators and, and to align our policies in this space. So I'll leave it there, but we are really happy to follow up if there's any questions um, at a later date. Thank you very much. And thank you for your patience with my tech. Debacle. Thanks so thanks so much, Annika. Um, three great presentations from our panelists. My timekeeping has been poor. We only have three minutes left for questions. So um, a quick shout out to see if anyone has any questions, if they'd like to raise their hand. Or Jane, did you have anything in the chat? Uh, no, people have been very helpful with each other. And just to repeat what I've said in the chat, I'm actually going to try and collate all of these resources and we'll try and share them around so that um, you can concentrate on the speakers. Um, so uh, I'll do that hopefully next week where I get that information. But no, we don't have any specific questions at this point, Mel. Um, okay. I can't see hands up either. Okay. Uh, well, if we don't have any from any attendees, I might ask a question um, to our panellists. Sorry, was some was that you, Paul? I, I had a question, but let's go with yours. Oh, go for it. Go for it, Paul. Um, I was just going to ask the last speaker this this concept of um, you know, offering a high value site to a CPO in exchange for a low value. Has that anybody successfully like so you're starting to see people charging uh, rent for their bays, uh, which is still fairly low, a um, couple of K a year maybe. Um, but uh, this exchange thing, has, has that happened that you're aware of? I know it was a concept put forward. Yeah, look, I'm not aware of it. Elliot might actually be able to speak to this as it's um, something that's come through our conversations um, in phase three. So I'm not sure if you're still in the call, area, Elliot. We're not aware of it happening, but um, we're wow. interested to explore this. And I think it would require a regional approach. So there was sort of sufficient um, scale um, and enough sort of high demand sites that would be of interest to a charge point operator, um, you know, giving them access to all of those locations in return for, you know, councils, for example, are interested in charges at places like regional sporting facilities um, because, you know, councils often view charges as a service um, and there is demand for access to charging at those locations, particularly in places like Bendigo and Ballarat where people travel in from the regions on the weekend and spend all day there with their kids for sport. And But that's obviously not going to be an appealing location for um, you know, for charge point operators. So looking at sort of what are the sites that we would, councils would like to offer as a service to community and can they bundle them together with some higher value sites? Mm -hmm. But um, Elliot, you might be able to add to that from your experience. Um, um, Elliot's, sure. yeah. I think Elliot's, yeah, he's left us. Yeah, and my, and also just mention, we, we do have some time after our present all our presentations for questions. So if we don't get to them now, save them up for, for the end as well. Sorry, Mel, back to you. Yeah. No, no, I, I could share a a brief comment on the Kingston end because we've just finished our EOI, for, um, put it out to the market. We had um, 13 submissions for our EOI and it was a wide range of different charge point operators. Um, we focused on DC primarily, but also opened it up to AC operators as well. Um, in our experience, so we, we, we listed out basically 12 priority sites that we were looking at over the next three years and then phase that out for another six years with another six additional sites um, and specified, look, we want to try to get 
maximum coverage um, possible. And we appreciate that there may be some sites that are more desirable than others from a commercial perspective. What we found was that the operators came back and and they would often list, um, you know, some some said, look, we're just interested in one site or two sites. Um, those tended to be the ultra fast chargers that um, they were focusing on. Others said, look, we'll do a wider range and we'll do anywhere from, you know, four to I think nine sites was probably the the, the one that had the broadest coverage. And um, and the rates that we were seeing in terms of rents uh, ranged for anywhere from a thousand five hundred to five thousand per bay um, from from the proposals. Um, so there definitely is a commercial case that's emerging now, and charge point operators are increasingly more comfortable with putting it covering that capex cost is what we're seeing because uh, we basically said, look, we're not doing that from our from our council end. Um, so um, yeah, now is the negotiation though of okay, well if we give you these you know, five sites, for example, will you take on some that are less commercially attractive, essentially, if we give you a few. Um, but I think that there is there is a willingness to to look at that from the market perspective. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vincent. And um, yeah. yeah, thank you for your um, additional information and, and a big thank you to our panellists, um, Helen, Paul and Annika. Thanks so much. Back to you, Bernadette. Great. Thanks, Mel. Yes, 